Hello, Joe. Hi, John. You're the first one here. There's, there's like a hundred people watching us. How from the chat? How are you? Fine. How are you? Are you in Spain or are you here? Yeah. No, no, I'm in Madrid. I'm in Madrid. And how's lockdown there? It's harsher than here, I think, isn't it? It has been. Yeah, they've just started lifting some some sanctions now, so we can uh, we can we can do what you can do now. We can go for walks and yeah. runs. Not that I intend to go running or anything like that, but yeah, <laughs> we can. I can if I want. I don't want to. But the, the cool thing is now, now we can uh, uh, you can take kids out, and we have uh, we've uh, four. You've got a little one, haven't you? Hello. Ah, oh, Nick. How are hello, you? Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I like to see, I like Joe's put a bit of production design. He's put a load of scene cards behind him just so he looks legit. I didn't realise it would be so clear. <laughs> so are you two spending lots of time together as you promote the movie on Zoom? Uh, uh, not too much. So this is our first joint thing, is it? Oh, good. Did most, I yeah. think so, yeah. Well, we, had, we had a bit of stuff yeah. to do um, just before just before lockdown we did we did a lot of our stuff before the the cinema release and then um yeah it's much much more relaxing promoting it from your bedroom from actually from your good. bedroom or lounge much much yeah. more uh well listen guys thank you for making time to chat to us at the nfts because this is a really exciting masterclass. i tweeted about it at the weekend because um the move is brilliant that's my that's my take on it. So we'll talk a bit about it. We'll, we'll start with that. Um, but actually, you guys are brilliant. And I wanted to come back. I wanted to tell the story of that a bit because I think it's really inspiring for the for the students that are watching us. And Nick, by the way, people are already watching us. There's like 100 people. So, um, oh, shit. So, <laughs> <start. laughs> so why don't we kick off with when you two first had a conversation about the short story and the idea of turning it into a movie. Joe, did you find that short story or how did it work? That all came from Nick. Right. Um, yeah, so I, uh, it was kind of, uh, uh, it was, I can't remember when we started doing our graduation film, but I, it, I was trying to, I was trying to start um, writing that. I just finished my digi fiction. Right. Do you know what? Uh, which, which I'd done, which I'd done with Joe. That's brilliant because um, this timing is what the current students are doing right now. They've just finished oh, UG okay. and they're going into grad, so it's great. Yeah, so it's around this time in uh, that would be 2014, I guess. Um, I, uh, I Joe was too busy to work with me after Digi. After Digi, he said he didn't have time, so I was like, okay, I have to write myself, <laughs> and I was doing quite a bad job because I hadn't, I hadn't really written. Uh, anything by myself but I was sort of giving it a go and failing miserably so I was I, I bought I was buying loads of short story books and um and it just so happened that Young Skins uh, the collection by Colin Barrett uh, came out um at around the same time and I, I bought it and read it and fell in love with with Calm With Horses in particular um and I sent it to um uh, Dan Emerson the producer and he was he was trying to get the option on it and and that kind of um and actually as while i was i was trying to cast my graduation film i went to troika talent agency um to meet um these agents and they were sort of interested in signing me anyway after they saw my first year film and, uh, um and they were so they were sort of saying what do you want to do once you graduate um and i i mentioned come with horses and um, it it just so happened that um connor the agent there was also trying to option the same story for oh, right, wow. but for, for dmc um so it was just a bit of serendipity really and then um and then you know i i was pretty sure i wanted joe um to adapt it because obviously we'd built up a really good relationship um yeah. over you know over the nfts and thankfully he did um end up coming to sort of uh, fix my grad film and, and co-write that. Yeah, we'll come, we'll come back to the shorts. So did you start um, writing this before you left the NFTS or did that all happen afterwards? Yeah, it was before. It was before, wasn't it, Nick? It was, um, 
yeah, I, you know, I opened up my, my folder on it the other day and I think it said the first thing I wrote on it was like June 2014 or something right, like that. You were right in the middle of your final year. Yeah, yeah. So that's when I started writing the, yeah, the treatment for it then. Um, then we did a pretty brief You had nothing else to do, Joe. You had nothing else to do at that time in your second no. year of your course. Nothing. It's wide open. Um, <laughs> then there was, uh, it was a pretty rigorous uh, um, treatment process for well over a year anyway before I started writing the actual script, the first draft of the script. So, and who set that down? Was that what you guys wanted to do or was that how it was going to get greenlit? That was, I, I was completely putting my faith in, in the producers, in, in, in Dan Emerson and, and everyone at DMC for that. And that's, that's, you know, I was just out of film school and that's, they were telling me that's how it was done. And I was just kind of going with the flow. And it turns out that that was the absolute best way to do it because it, it, it wasn't something that I had done before, but it's something I make sure I do now on every project I write. Even if I'm writing something on spec, I'll still go through a good few uh, treatments or something because I find that you... Not 100%, but you get rid of a lot of the, not, not, not the, I don't say shit ideas, but the ideas that had the potential to be a lot of crap when you came, you know, like uh, Nick will probably remember the kinds of things that we talked about doing. Um, they got fleshed out and put to one side throughout the treatment process. You know, at one point, arm was, um, <laughs> I don't know, was it, it became it was like, like a stable hand or something. Yeah, he worked like, um, stable. Yeah. He was like bare knuckle boxing at night, and it was yeah. <laughs> so, so that yeah, the treatment process. You kind of you, you answer some of those problems, and then how how long does that treatment end up kind of being? Is it, it sounds like it has to be quite substantive to get all the story beats. Yeah, that was a that was a, that was a bit of a beast in the end. That was a I think it was about ten thousand words or so. Wow, a big thing. So it was yeah. And we made like a we 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 kind of illustrated it and made a sort of um, almost tr turned it into like a graphic novel, not not with illustrations, but you know with mood images or or reference or you know fo photos or or artworks or what or, or other yeah. films to kind of illustrate the tone for funding. Of Nick. The piece. As you, yeah, was actually for funding. Now that Ian tells your earlier question, John. Now that I just remembered that now, Nick, that was that was like part of trying to get film four on board we were and because we were just out of film school you know it, it isn't the kind of thing we would need to do again now but at the same time it was extremely beneficial just from from my point of view anyway just from a story perspective it, it was very good but yeah, yeah it was there was a there was a concern um i guess we started so um we, we we took the book to a few places including film four and everyone liked it but i guess there was a sort of unanimous concern uh, i guess when you first read the collection, it's quite, there's a bleakness to it. And I think uh, on first reading, a lot of people were seeing more of a kitchen sink kind of, um, you know, bleak social realism kind of yeah. um, piece, which is not really what we saw. But um, so we felt along with the treatment, we had to work quite hard to kind of um, counteract yeah. people's expectations that it might be uh it, it, you know it, it would be too grim i guess yeah so let's pause calm with horses for a second i want to just talk a little bit about your relationship at the school briefly so nick you made three shorts the first one got nominated for a bafta for your first year film slap the second one which was the first time you worked with joe i think was yeah. Went to Sundance, got selected for Sundance, and you rocked up and chatted to the Mormons about your film. And then the third, the third one uh, uh, got nominated for a Student Academy Award. So pretty stellar sort of routine. But through the Stigi film and the Grad film, you two formed a really powerful sort of partnership. And I wondered, Nick, whether you might just talk a little bit about, you know, did you know that you were going to want to work with a writer? Does it feel for you like it lessens your sense of authorship working with a writer? There's a bit of that, I think, among some directors that I meet with. So I wonder whether you might talk a bit about why that relationship was important for you. Um, I, I mean, I'd, I, I haven't really, I didn't, I've never really sort of seen myself as a, a writer director. And I've always, I mean, I, before going to the film school, I, I had written and directed, or well, that the film I used to get in, I, I yeah. written. And um, but I kind of, yeah, and it, it didn't, you know, I felt like I did that out of necessity. And um, 
Um, but I kind of saw, no, I, I think I went in knowing that I wanted to work with writers. I thought I'd, I felt like I had so much to focus on in, in terms of learning how to, you know, direct. But, yeah. um, and I, and I guess, um, what I found intimidating was the time scale more, I guess was the first thing of like, you know, maybe I could write one good short film, but how am I going to write? three yeah. right you know with with the amount of time you have in between them so um it made sense to me and I, and I it's just i i enjoy i enjoy the um the collaboration really and yeah. and, and like i i tend to i mean joe can i'm sure give lots of examples of this but i tend to, i can come up with lots of i sometimes come up with good ideas i sometimes come up with like really bad ideas and i always need someone to point out when they're <laughs> terrible and and um when they're okay I guess. and briefly because i want the students to go and find these when we can get back to the campus the the digi film tell, tell us what that is and tell us what the grad film is just so that people get a sense of what you guys were doing together before this uh the digi it was like a i don't know joe what how what's is it like a horror film or psychological? yeah it, well it turned out as a kind of psychological thriller i guess if we had to pin it down um i mean it, what it the, the interesting thing about it is that it kind of was a genre film which we didn't really make um before or after that the part of the digi thing i think you've said before nick was like you have to challenge yourself to make a film you wouldn't normally yeah. make and i think that was quite liberating certainly for me and i think it was for you as well nick to, to, to go full to go full genre play around with the tropes you know shoot it in black and white do some cool crazy camera moves um that kind of stuff yeah and then you were then you made a film about a rally kind of driver, Nick, in your for your grad film. And as you said, you started off on your own without Joe, but then Joe quickly got involved. And that yeah. starred uh, Richard Madden, didn't it? Yeah. So that was so I. Um, so yeah, the the digi fiction. It was I, the digi fiction was based off like an, a, a a news article we read at the time, um, and. That was and like yeah, it was it was kind of all about um, getting used to genre filmmaking, and then and then the the grad film was a lot different because it was because I used to be a I used to compete in in rallies um, and motorsport before I went into filmmaking, and I found um, I I obviously had a lot of um, I knew the world in a very detailed way, and I kind of knew how a lot of stuff felt and and. Um, but I, I, I realized I was just getting stuck in my own. I was, you know, I, I need someone as an outsider to say, well, actually, this is how we, you know, actually, this is interesting. Although you think that's interesting, actually, it's kind of irrelevant and um, really focusing, you know, Joe's so good at focusing on story, whereas I, I get really caught up on like emotion and, and feeling things where, and I can sometimes get lost in that and forget actually well what's the story about yeah great well we should took so the the grad film's called group b and they're all in the library the first year film's called slap what's remind me did your film's called um uh out of sight yeah there you go yeah, yeah. great um so 2014 in the summer you guys set about writing the treatment for this and it's just coming out now so that's like a five six year journey without giving us the kind of beat by beat talk us broadly through how that time's been spent is that a <laughs> year, <laughs> a year it's like, writing, yeah. or is it what what where's the where why is it taken five or six years because i think that's pretty typical for a, a first feature it's i think so i would say the first part of that was chasing um the commission or you know we we were you know we had our hearts our hearts set on on doing it with film four and they were they kind of um unofficially developed it with us for a while before actually sort of committing to it you know so they would uh what did, so that um you know they would they would read our treatments and give us notes and stuff but they it, they weren't fully ready to sort of jump on board so i think there was i mean timing wise i can't really it felt like there was a good few months or doing that of, of, of doing that and just trying to find it's so important um there's a there's a definitely i there's a 
a desperation to just make your first film, but um, it's so important to make sure everyone knows the film that you're making and that everyone yeah. agrees and understands what film you're making. So I feel like there was a lot of time spent just making sure we we were all on the same creative page, I guess. Yeah. And then, um, and I think, and I think then, I think in the end, we, Joe, maybe you went, we kind of went to draft immediately or they, or we, or maybe we, I haven't been given the green light, you, you moved to writing the actual screenplay or. I think so. I think, I can't remember exactly. And while this is, and Nick, while this is all going on, you, you're not getting paid, is that right? So you're, you have to go off and direct TV while this is all happening. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, I, I didn't, um, I didn't get paid anything until we went into production. So, um, so I would, I would do, I was doing like six months, six, seven months of the year, I'd be doing television. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of the time, you know, there'd always be a window in the second half of the year where I, we could work more in, intensely on it. And then there'd be periods where I would, I would kind of go missing for a little bit. Um, yeah. And, but, Joe, but like quite, yeah. and Joe, you're balancing this alongside a number of other projects as well as yeah. the reality of this sort of level of independent filmmaking. Yeah, it was, um, so obviously I was getting paid to write, but you know, I was just out of film school, so it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't by any means a lot to, um, I know this is going outside of the NFTS, yeah. I'm not complaining about that. No, no, it wasn't, the reality. It, it wasn't a lot of money, uh, um, yeah. to begin with anyway, you know, because it, 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 fair enough, it was my first first film. Yeah. But, um, so I was working on a, on a lot of different things just to sort of, to sort of get by, I guess, really. Um, I really didn't want to have to take on a part-time job if I could help it. Yeah. Um, just because I just knowing the way I work, I don't particularly, I don't work particularly well to a schedule. Um, Cause I love writing. So I, I like to write when I want to write, if that makes yeah. sense. It's never really worked for me that like work in between like seven and 11 and then you have a whiskey and then you yeah. like, <laughs> an old Hemingway thing, whatever. Cause then when you, cause then if you don't write anything good for those hours, then you're just punishing yourself the rest of the day. Like, Oh, you know, so, so I didn't want to have a part time job is, is, is yeah, the long short of it. So I, I, worked on quite a lot of other projects um a lot of that stuff was trying to get original things off the ground which in retrospect now probably wasn't a very wise move because you know no one wanted to actually make this stuff and and it was yeah. like we're getting a you know a small fee for uh you know for the copyright to some idea and then trying to get off the ground as a tv show for a while and you know it wouldn't pan out blah, blah, blah. But, um that's just, I think that's just something. At the same time, that was an extremely good education that someone writes straight out of film school to be yeah. working on multiple things, you know, because you work with a lot of different people and you start to realize, okay, well, that, that thing didn't work or that person didn't work or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I think you get yeah, throwing yourself into the deep end, I think really helped me. And so there's a screen, and by the way, before we move on, I just need to say Joe won um, Best Overall Student when we were at the school. Because, and I remember you winning it because you got given a projector at the end at the grad ceremony, which was like this massive projector. And the reason Joe won it was because I don't, and I don't think in all my eight years at school, this has ever been done since, but you wrote seven short films that got made. Got made. That got made as part of the school. That's pretty rare for a screenwriting student to have seven shorts at the end. But anyway, that's an aside. Um, so we've got screenplay and we're moving into production. How long can it, how long, can you shoot for a kind of budget level like this? How long was your shoot, Nick? Uh, I think the shoot was 28, 29 days, something right. like that. Um, and prep was, I can't remember, it was short, not, not very long in prep as well, which was um, actually more of a killer than, I, like, I'd be, I guess I'd done, doing TV, I was kind of used to doing like six or seven pages a day so in a way actually it didn't feel other than the fact that you only we only had one camera and I'd sort of gotten used to using two um it felt fairly similar but the thing that really the real killer is how little prep time you have because it just makes every it just the shoot becomes much harder because you just everyone's slightly chasing their tail a little bit yeah, yeah. and and you shoot in Ireland west coast of Ireland is that right yeah, we shot in um, uh, Gaul, like all our interiors were in Galway and then we, um, 
uh, went out to the mountains in Connemara, which was about a couple of hours away. And then our sort of exterior um, locations were uh, in a town called Kilkee on the west coast, which is another two hours away. So we were really spread out, um, which was uh, so we lost we lost time with travel and um, logistical issues. Um, but it felt worth it because the, you know, the, the locations were so unique and it, and it goes back to, you know, a desire to, to make the film uh, not a kind of council estate kitchen sinky sort of thing. We wanted it to feel a little bit bigger, I guess, despite it being quite an intimate story. Did you have um, visual references and sort of film, go-to films that we, you would use as a shorthand with HODs you were bringing on in, in terms of help, how you got people to understand you didn't want it to be this kitchen sinky sort of British film? Uh, yeah, more, not so much, I mean, I get, there were film references, but a lot of like, yeah, a lot of photography references and fashion references. And we had a huge, a huge collection of, like a, a a sort of mood board bible of of, of all sorts of things um, and that was actually really useful um, you know when we were uh, crewing up with HODs and stuff like that is you know uh, often you'd you'd see very quickly how how your instincts were matching with with people and stuff like that so that was that was uh, useful um, I mean a lot of references like uh, most of the film is either handheld or is on a or is on a tripod. There's like maybe one or two tracking shots and a couple of slider shots and stuff. But it, you know, we tried to just keep it quite simple, just because you know because we didn't we didn't have a big crew and a lot of time and stuff like that. So. And Joe, did you go on the shoot or did you stay stay away? No, I um I would have been on the shoot. It was i happened to be getting married at the exact same uh day that they started shooting getting married here in, in spain so i i managed to fly over for the uh for the read through and the rehearsals you know a few days before that um otherwise i very much would have liked to have been on set then again in reality like i often find when i am on set i'm just sort of fucking hanging around the place in a way so i i might not have enjoyed it as much as i thought i would but i loved being there for the read through um that's definitely something i want to do on every production I can because just hearing just meeting the actors and hearing them say in your your dialogue um yeah you know because you've been saying it in your head or even out loud for you know five years and then someone who actually knows what they're doing comes in and says it and it, it just sounds incredible when you get a good actor yeah well on, on that note Nick, the cast is amazing and you work with Shaheen on the casting of it Do you want to talk about that process and attracting Barry and, and Cosmo and because it's a really fantastic kind of up-and-coming cast. Yeah it was um, yeah so Shaheen came on which is great um, and uh, I think she has uh, you know everyone she just has such an amazing track record especially with like um, you know the way she sort of discovers talent and stuff like that so I think having Shaheen on board was a real a real boost um, and and I also like a, a lot of actors really s responded well to the script so um it felt like there was uh it, it felt like we were going to be able to assemble a, a good group and it, it started with barry um we sort of wrote that part for him um, and you knew barry nick didn't you well he was in so um my housemate um while I was at the NFTS, Phil Sheeran, uh, uh, Barry was in his first year film. Yeah. So uh, Barry stayed in our, we were staying next to, um, next to m and our, 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 our yeah. house we were renting. What's, was, <laughs> what's that? People were we living in old people. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Craigslist or something. You know, it's just, just uh, next to m and I don't know why I'm pointing. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, cool. And... So yeah and and yeah so barry stayed in our in our little flat while they were shooting first year film um and um yeah he just turned up with his playstation and would just sort of sit sit and um and so we i got to know him a little bit there but um, um did that help yeah he was so, think that he knew you and when it comes to kind of trying to do the deal uh no i think I, by this point hasn't he he's done a lot of big films yeah, I think I think with actors, you know, it's just about the part, really. That's yeah. um, and you know, um, and if it's, 
I think that's the main thing. I mean, Barry certainly didn't, um, you know, he didn't need to do the film, um, you know, he, you know, but um, so, and that was, I guess that was the first part of the puzzle and that was quite useful for um, kind of, I'm, I can't remember where our finance was at that point. I think maybe we had half of our finance or uh, most of it, but I think there was a few, uh, um, uh, there's a few pieces of the puzzle left to go so it was really useful getting Barry on board at that point and then um, and then uh, yeah Cosmo was next and um, originally I was I, I wanted because I'm um, not Irish I, was, I I wanted the film to be as Irish as possible and I'd kind of imagined um, having an all Irish cast but then when Cosmo auditioned he he just kind of and understood the spine of the character so well it just felt fairly obvious that he would you know that it was meant to be him and then it, it just became about sort of making sure everyone else was on board and um confident because obviously he he hadn't um it would be his it was his first sort of uh, leading role in, um, yeah. he moved to um, ireland i read that he moved to ireland a few weeks before the shoot just to make sure he was completely immersed in the la the, the kind of is that right he to make yeah. sure the accent was totally nailed yeah, he he came out pretty much at the same time as me, so he was there uh, the whole time of prep, staying in the local town, and um, um, and he was spending time with his dialect coach and just kind of getting to know the local people. And everyone just thought he was this local lad that had sort of sprung from the ground or something. And he stayed in that voice, didn't he, the whole time he was there as well? Stayed in that. Yeah, yeah, he's he's he's. Um, I don't. Yeah, I guess he's he's more of a method actor. I'm not sure if he would. Yeah. what he would class himself as but he was he was in accent and to a degree he was sort of in character all of the time and it's weird like I'd spent a bit of time with Cosmo um in the auditions and then uh, and then life. yeah he was just I kind of I forgot who Cosmo was after a while and I was just dealing with this kind of <laughs> this character <laughs> you know um I and it was weird yeah <laughs> when I was there for the read it's it's he he kind of like um, it was only yeah once we wrapped he went back to being Cosmo and it it's only when he came out of character that I realised um, it's like I only realised when he came out of it that he'd been so different from yeah. the guy I met because he sort of morphed over the more he started to understand the character obviously he sort of it sort of develops and I guess like seeing uh, you don't notice your not that I have a kid or a dog, I guess. So you don't know. Well, I know actually dogs grow quite fast. Don't you? Anyway, ignore yeah. that. <laughs> so last couple of questions from me and then we'll go to the students. Um, there's an epic car chase in this movie. Um, yeah. And I wondered, uh, that was doable because of your experience on Group B, was it? That you could do, because normally films of this sort of budget range wouldn't have a scene like that. I wonder whether you might yeah, so talk about that being that coming about and being delivered. We had, um, yeah, it was. Uh, we had one day to film that, and you know, anything, anything with moving cars and car mounts, and you know, uh, having you know, police lock off roads and all that sort of stuff. Just, um, I knew from doing the, some television stuff that it's extremely time consuming. But um, yeah, we basically it was basically a, a carbon copy of what we did on our grad graduation film so uh, it was kind of funny because everyone was really worried uh, on the production everyone was freaking out about it the whole time I was like it's cool it's fine it's all going to be it's all going to be easy um and basically we just had we had our hero car which is a Toyota Celica and then for that scene we had a um, a left-hand drive copy of the same car so there could there was a stunt and but we put the right hand side dash in and a fake steering wheel so the stunt driver would drive the car and Cosmo would sit in the passenger seat and just kind of mimic what the stunt driver was doing. A kind of like Maggie in The Simpsons in the opening credits, you know, where she's kind of got the toy. That's essentially what all it is. And, um, but it's really effective because you really get that, you, you're able to go sort of full speed rather than be on a low load or anything like that. Massively visceral. It's really brilliant. And what's that like on the page, Joe? Do you, how much, I mean, I know with Group B, which is all about all those details were important in the script. Yeah. Is it the same with this movie? With this, there was, there was kind of the, I, like, I always knew that Nick was going to do a, an amazing job with this. And the last thing I 
wanted to do was try and write a car, you know, like he swings it to the left, you can tell I don't drive. Um, <laughs> so in, on the page, it was more about the emotion of the scene and that, you know, just the absolute fear of, you know, at first he thinks he's gotten away and then he looks in the rear view mirror and then the think the other trucks coming over the hill, things that didn't necessarily translate into actual yeah. shots, but, but the whole, it's important to get the mood of it down. Yeah. I did some work with uh, with Gareth Evans, you know, directed the, the Raid yeah. series in Gangs of London. I was, I was asking him about how do you write a fight, one of those fight scenes? What does that look like on the page? And he said, it should be like three lines. Just get the the, the, the feeling of the fight. Is it is it a scrap between two people who don't know how to fight? Is it too amazing? Much like, you know, what get the tone of it and then just hand it over to your stunt coordinator or fight choreographer or whoever it is in charge because the... Uh, People hate it when you try and write that stuff mm. down, you know, That's six good. To the left hand, whatever. And so I, I kind of did the same thing with, with, the, with the car chase. Yeah. And Nick, um, the music, I know that that was a labour of love for you. Do you want to talk a bit about getting Black Mance involved? Because I saw this as a rough cut without that music. And the music's really a key part of the overall kind of delivery of the film. Yeah, um, it was kind of, so the... The story's quite um, quite sort of classical and, and straightforward. In, well, there's a simplicity to it, I should say. Um, but at, but what was what's kind of deceptively complicated about it is that there are quite a lot of competing sort of mi mixed tones in the story. There's the there's the kind of the the uh, the is is a crime thriller but then slightly heightened sort of eccentric comedic uh, sequences as well so trying to find um uh like the, the music was always going to be key and sort of it needed we needed to find a, a sound that would accommodate especially the 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 kind of the the emotional drama with the crime thriller and finding um a, a sound uh, a score that would be able to kind of move quite fluidly between those two uh, emotions I guess or feelings um, um, and yeah I was, I've been a huge um, you know I, uh, uh, I really like Blank Mass and Fuck Buttons um, that Ben was in um, the group he was in before and um, I'd always imagine one day like being able to have a score uh, done by Ben and um, but I never I, I never really thought about it for Karma Forces because it um, because a lot of Ben's stuff is like I guess there's like an aggression or an intensity to it. And I, I, I wasn't, um, I just didn't think, but then um, he, he, he wrote some pieces for it. He, he watched the rough cut and sort of wrote a few pieces and it just, the, the, like the opening theme, there's a, a, at the start of the film, there's a voiceover section where it basically sets up the story and there's some, you know, a sort of, uh, the track he wrote for that is just, is the track he sent me as a demo. And I just didn't touch it because it was just, it just felt, it just really captured the kind of the tone. Um, One of the students actually yeah. asked whether, how early you had the music, but it, it wasn't until you were in post. Is that right? You didn't have anything when you were on the shoot. No, no, it was all it was all post. And actually, because the um, we needed the meet, like for example, there's like a sequence uh, in the nightclub, and Ben wrote. So there's the music that's actually playing in the club is that the, diegetically or, or whatever um but it's also acting as as score because the, the the club track changes um depending on um uh what's going on in the scene and, and it sort of reacts to arms emotions in the scene so it kind of doubles up in a way um and it needed to the music needed because arm doesn't say much um and sometimes isn't very good at expressing himself that often the mu the score had to be quite precisely connected to the edit and to the beats of the scenes and stuff. So, um, but funny enough, I did find like on my iPhone, I found an old recording of, of me testing bits of voiceover with blank, blank mass music, which was like from years ago, you which were. I'd forgotten about. So, and, and just actually, I'm going to, I'm going to bring Marcus in in a minute. So get yourself ready, Marcus. But, um, the voiceover, it's only at the beginning. Was there more of it in the script? What, how did that, what was the journey of using that voiceover? Because I, I guess that was, it's really critical and it's beautifully done, but I guess it was tricky to get that right. 
it, it, at the very beginning when we started writing, um, I'd gone for a kind of a, we, we were train spotting was a big uh, um, reference for us, um, especially in the uh, early stages of the script development. And so at one point it was voiceover throughout the whole movie, but it just, it just felt a bit much to be honest. And, and, and kind of thank God we didn't do that now looking back at it because of, of the fact that we've got Cosmo in there and the amount of stuff he's doing with his, with his face and his expressions, like you don't, you don't need that, you know? Yeah. Um, but in the, in the finished script, it bookends the film. There's voiceover at the beginning and, and the end. Um, but yeah, things get. Um, yeah, you're here. So quick, so let's go to Marcus, because he had a question. Um, let's bring Marcus in. Marcus, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, uh, how are you doing? Um, yeah, thanks for doing this. Super inspiring seeing what you guys have been doing. I think us, what, all the directors are really inspired and, um, and actually really like the film. We're all kind of in agreement on that. Um, so, yeah, I've got a bit of a broad question. So how difficult did you find the process of your first feature? Um, and what was the steepest learning curve for you? <clears throat> and how would you say that your work at the school and in television has prepared you for making that leap from shorts to feature? Um, I'm not going to lie, it, it's hard. <laughs> it was really, it was really hard. Um, usually filled with um, fear and self-doubt and, and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, uh, I think, I mean, the good thing is, is that um, we get an awful lot of like film four and, and, and DMT and everyone were very nurturing, I guess. Um, and, um, but ultimately, uh, you know, you end up, I felt very aware of, of, needing it to go well and i think also especially at the moment you know it's like every you know beast and lady macbeth and um i'm not a witch you know every, every year all these amazing um debuts keep getting made and you want to you know i, I didn't want to i felt a pressure to kind of to to kind of live up to that i guess and that's not a very helpful thought process um but it's i think it's one that's kind of hard to avoid um so, so nick is is the step up kind of psychological rather than technical that... yeah i i i really like the, in a way i mean tv was really good um because it you get used to the pressure the professional infrastructure of you know working with commissioners and 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 uh, executive producers and and um the kind of responsibility of delivering something on budget and on schedule and, and just kind of getting used to shooting for 30 days and things like that. But um, in a way, I think uh, I slightly assumed that I was, it would be similar with the feature film, but actually there's a huge difference between directing episodes five and six of some series that's already in existence because, you know, the cast are already there, the, the design of the show, the, setting the sets are all you know so much of the work is already done you're i'm just there really just to kind of um work with the actors and stuff so i kind of got a false sense of security going into calm with horses and then suddenly i realized uh, there's just so much more to think about when when every every everything's from scratch um even from crewing up and and the, and the casting through so and also suddenly you're you know in a position where you don't have a lot of prep time and you don't have a lot of money to throw at problems and um it feel in a way the feature film felt a bit more like going back to um student films not not in terms of this anything other than just there's not you just don't have much money and you have to be very creative and light on your feet and um so no uh, yeah, from a technical, from a filmmaking point of view, it's all fairly, it's all fairly similar. The only difference is just what's going on in your head. Let's bring B in, who had a question about the autism storyline. B, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, B. Hi, Nick. Um, so this is following on from my question from last week about the portrayal of autism in the film. Um, as someone on the spectrum, it felt really raw. And I was wondering if you could elaborate 
on how you worked with the actor playing Jack and how you got such a truthful performance and relationship between him and Arm. Also, I should just say, um, I don't think I'd be sitting here without you and having worked on your films. And so, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. B, B, worked on, um, B worked on our digifiction. She was the producer. Oh, really? In, her, in Glorious High Wickham? Yes. <laughs> the best production design job I've ever had. I got to turn oh. up and catch a house. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, well, we, so we developed the script with the National Autistic Society um, from a really early stage. Um, I can't remember when exactly, Joe, but that, so like that the first draft, I think we went, went to them, if not sure. Yeah. Might be wrong. So a lot of, there was some stuff, even at script stage, they were, they were kind of guiding, uh, guiding us and, and making sure, you know, they're saying one of the big crimes is to, is to be too, you know, it's such, uh, you know, autism is so specific. And so, um, you know, the worst thing to do would be to, to kind of cherry pick um, um, or, or have like an inconsistency to the character um, because it's so, um, you know, such a wider spectrum. Um, so that was, that was a large part. And then um, I guess in terms of, in terms of like the performance of Jack, um, uh, be, because of the sort of stressful nature of, of the scenes he'd be in um, and his age, he was only five years old. Um, uh, they advised that we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be able to cast a, an autistic child, so we'd have to find a local, uh, a local boy and sort of create create the performance. Um, and 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 as, uh, there was a stage where, you know, there we're sort of being encouraged to maybe cast a slightly older child because if he was nine years old, then you'd get more time on set and with a five-year-old you, you only get him for five hours a day and stuff like that but um he had to be five years old for the story to be authentic because that's you know that's the age where um because he's non-verbal that's that's kind of the age where it would be diagnosed it, it just wouldn't occur any later than that um so it was a case of you know visiting visiting lots of um uh, families and spending time with the kids and kind of um observing and then um, actually, it was um, Lenny Abrahamson um, sort of uh, chatted with me uh, on a few occasions and talked to me because he had he'd done Room uh, with Jacob uh, Tremblay, the young boy, and obviously that the you know what he did in Room was incredible, and um, he gave me some really smart tips, which was just to to kind of not ex to not expect to be able to. Um, um, sustain a whole performance like a whole scene you know it's about it's about kind of finding little moments that you can use in the edit so often the camera is very close on Killian um and it it was just a we played a game basically of um you know uh, essentially kind of like you know when you try and pat your head and no yeah pat your head and yeah. stroke your stomach essentially that was the basis of the performance so um if we were in a room if we we're in the restaurant i'd ask him to count how many mustard bottles are on all the tables in the room but at the same time he had to um do his t times tables in his head or i'd get him to try and use as many of his senses at once as and treat it as a game and basically that was the kind of baseline for the performance and then it was just about getting him to do specific whatever the specifics of the, the scene were great jack i'm not going to bring jack in but jack had a follow-up kind of he had a question related to this was about working with actors generally and how you go about i mean the performances are brilliant so does that is there rehearsal how do you go about getting trust and building the character with with the cast um uh so we didn't really have any rehearsal, but um, uh, I would use kind of the audition process as a lot of trial and error, especially with, with Jack, the character of Jack, you know, so I, I must have seen a hundred boys maybe. Um, yeah. um, so each time I would kind of practice a new direction or practice a new, you know, I basically use it as research to try and work out how to kind of um, generate the performance. Um, so that was a lot of trial and error, really. And then once once he was cast, um, it was about just 
we I made sure any sort of stressful emotional scenes were were scheduled as late as possible within the shoot. Um, so he had plenty of time to be uh, comfortable and and start and understand the process. Um, and and yeah, just spending as much time with with Cosmo and Eve as possible, and 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 learning and having a very strict boundary between um, what is play and make believe uh, and what's not. So if there's like a stressful scene, it was very important that when we called cut, everyone made sure there was a, a clear difference that it was make believe and fun. Um, so yeah, stuff like that. Let's bring Jack Pollington in. Uh... See how quick I can type. Are you there, Jack? Hello. Hi, hey, guys. Hey, Jack. Hey, thanks for chatting to us. Um, the yeah, film no is worries. really, really good. So congratulations to both of you. Um, you. You mentioned a couple of times about um, DMC's involvement, which is obviously Michael Fassbender's uh, production company. Uh, simply my question is, how did that come about? Um, and what was the experience of working with them like? So yeah, uh, so yes, yeah, so as um, so, I I'd taken the book to Dan Emerson, who at the time was an assistant at Working Title, and we'd kind of met a few times. I think even before uh, I started the NFTS, and he was he, we were looking to sort of do something together, and um, he was trying to option the story um, for me or for us, and um, and it's when I was at Troika. Um, uh, meeting these agents casting my grad film that it, it turns out Connor, the agent at Troika, um, who also runs DMC, um, was, was trying to option it for, for, for Fassbender. So then he, you know, it was just a moment of luck really when he said, well, why don't, you know, because I was joining their agency anyway, he said, well, why don't you, why don't you, why don't we option it at DMC? And then um, Dan, Dan joined DMC he left working title joined dmc and became their sort of in-house producer um and we all sort of joined up together and it's been you know it was it was, it was uh, it's been a lot of fun just because i guess it was it's all of our first film um you know dan's dan's a similar age as well so we had we had a lot of hunger to get it made you know, which was um and we sort of felt it felt like we were all in it together Joe, Joe, you signed to Troika as well. I did shortly after. I, I, I then kind of like came into that whole thing that, that was going on there. Um, Nick obviously very kindly put my name forward to, to come onto the project as a writer, you know, from our, you know, because we had the experience together. And so I sent my sample scripts to Dan Emerson at DMC, who then passed them on to, to the people at Troika just I think just because he liked them, just how the kindness of his heart sent him on to, the, and and then so I found I ended up finding an agent there. So again, it was just you know this very serendipitous thing, as as Nick said. But yeah, my experience working with DMC has been absolutely brilliant. I have uh, I'm working on two other projects with them now, and and looking for a third any day. You know, I, they're, yeah, they're great, they're great. Um, Dan in particular because he, you know, it was his first feature as well, mm. which is mad thinking about it now actually because he was always. You know, he's one of my good friends now, but he was the boss. <laughs> he didn't mind cracking the whip, and 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 I love that about Dad. He's a, he's a similar age to us, but he very much, yeah, he very much led the ship, led the ship, steered the ship. steered the ship. But it but it also maybe speaks to the increasingly important role of agents as well, because there's a lot of agents now having production companies within mm -hmm. packaging movies in and that seems to have been quite a powerful part of you guys getting this movie away yeah no completely i mean that um uh i owe i owe uh you know connor sam and harriet at, at troika a lot really because even even before um ben you know they were I, I i first got in contact with them after my first year film because uh, joe cole Who's uh, who's in that film was re is represented by them as well, and from then I sort of developed a relationship. Um, and you know, even when I wasn't a client, you know, they were they helped me get Richard Madden and, and Michael Smiley to look at being in my grad film and stuff like that. So, you know, it really, and I think and I think having good actors in in our shorts was a big part of, you know, what helped get the TV and you know it's everything kind of snowballs a little bit. Yeah. Before I'm going to bring Ellen in a minute, 
because we're going to talk about the release of the movie maybe but um i wonder whether you might just talk about post and the process of refining it into the kind of finished product we see now because it wasn't straightforward was it you you had to try a few things out to get the tone and the kind of storytelling right can you talk a bit about that nick because i I think last time, one of the last times I see, saw you was you screening the film in the Rose Cinema at the NFTS, getting some notes. So talk a little bit about that, that journey for you and, and maybe Joe's role in feeding back on the story. Yeah, it, was, um, it wasn't an easy edit. I think partly because we, uh, we were, you know, we were trying to tell the story that has, has so many different sort of elements and tones to it. So it took, it felt like we got there in the end and um, but find you know getting the the tonal balance through the story just required you know yeah. if you nudged a little bit this way or that way it it would throw the whole thing off so it it was it was really really challenging um, um, and just kind of it's hard i think when i think I'd, but i don't know i don't have enough experience, but maybe it always feels like this but um it didn't feel it, it felt like I was trying to find the film for a lot longer than normal. And then again, it's like your own insecurities of like, well, does everyone think I've done a shit job and are people losing faith? And, you know, all, all, it's just, again, I felt, I felt as much pressure on, if it may be more pressure on my shoulders in the, in the post process, even than on the shoot, um, yeah. I guess. But you have, um, like, I remember you screened it to us and you had moved it, the introduction of Paulie, Paulie's characters earlier with the, in a cut before he had come much later in the story. Is that right? I mean, there's some quite big plot things that you, you move around to try and get the tone right. Yeah, we, we, we did a couple of days pickup um, pick scenes to basically introduce that character much earlier. Because um, we, in, in the original cut, um, He's not, you don't, you hear a lot about him, but you don't, you don't see him until the third act. And um, it, it, it was kind of interesting, but you kind of, um, we did some test screenings and like one of the main notes was why, why should we be scared of this guy? So yeah. that was like, and it was good. And it was kind of, obviously it's scary having, uh, you know, having a test screening reading that there's like a, you know, it's much nicer if everyone just goes, "Oh, your film's nice." But <laughs> we already we already know from the NFTS that that doesn't that doesn't happen <laughs> after the review. So. What um, but, you on that? Because you must have made that decision for us not to see that character until the third. Yeah, year. it was something that I had absolutely stoked my guns on for the whole script process. So that was quite a funny one. Funny from my point of view, not funny for poor Nick. But I I stoked my guns thinking like, "No, it's like apocalypse now. You you're, you're going to hear about this guy for the whole movie, and then he's going to appear." in the last 20 minutes out of the in shadows. Um, but it just didn't, it didn't really work like that. So you had to bring him in earlier. So that was, that was actually, um, it wasn't, you know, it was, I don't think it was that I was wrong at the scripts that it just, it was just an important lesson. I think in the end, just to watch something turn out differently in the edit and say, okay, well, how do we adapt? How do we, you to know, respond, when, to respond to what you got rather than the, yeah. what you thought you were going to have. Exactly, and letting go of what you what you what you had in mind, and yeah, making 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 what you have work even better than what your original idea might have been. You know, yeah. it's like already this was an adaptation, but I think in general, I always try and see scripts now as you know when they go from script to screen as a process of of, of adaptation. I think um, you know things are going to change and hopefully mostly it's going to be for the better yeah it certainly, was, certainly was in this case anyway nick it must have been good for you to be able to pick up the phone to joe and show cuts and talk about all that stuff as to have a, a kind of friend in it because it must it, go, it goes on for a long time the post, the post <laughs> yeah yeah it's a real it's a real um uh marathon actually more than i realized um because again in tv there's like a hard cutoff date you have like five weeks editing and three weeks of like finessing and then you're done you yeah. know whether you like it or not um, and that was the amazing thing about you know working with film four is it was about getting the film right you know um and spent you know so we were post went on for we shot the film in 20 
uh, when did we shoot it? 2018, summer of 2018. Um, and we, and we pitch locked it last August or something. Yeah. So it's a long, a long process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's great, great having, uh, you know, just again, I, when you're like in the trenches and you're kind of looking at the details all the time, it was really useful, but you know, Joe was always, um, very good at coming in and having and reminding me of like the overall story or what you know character motivations or you know I, I could box you know could easily go off on a tangent that wasn't very helpful and stuff like that. I know and one, then, I know one of the bits of posts that you found most pleasurable was being able to work with Mattis again on the sound design. I'm sure there's probably some sound students but I noticed in the credits that actually the location sounds done by NFTS students graduates who are from your year i think were they and then yeah mattis yeah. worked with you on group b yeah yeah bit. and and, and morgan did that. morgan did the dialogue get it oh, okay as well. um yeah it was it was really um i mean mattis so yeah mattis uh i did uh slap with and uh and uh, our grad film and um he just yeah it's just he's yeah he's just i don't know the, this I really, really, I mean, I appreciate everyone uh, who's at the NHS, but I, I really, I think, especially since working in industry a bit as well, it's, it, you know, the, the quality of the sound students is, is kind of hard to beat, really. That's great. And, um, and also just uh, the more you work with your friends, you know, the more, you know, especially with like a low budget thing as well, you kind of need people to go the extra mile and to, for it to not, you know obviously there are lots of people that are willing to do you favors but it's better to find people that don't see it as doing you a favor they're just as invested as you are yeah. um which is which is what we got yeah great let's bring ellen who wants to talk about the release of the uh, the movie you there el hello can you hello. guys hear me hi uh hey. hi guys um lovely to meet you and thank you for doing this um so uh, obviously you had your premiere at um, Toronto Film Festival and obviously it was covered at um, uh, the Dublin International and London and um, which I was lucky to cover it there. Um, considering you had a really prominent festival build up, um, how did you find the kind of the managing having to switch over to kind of a digital release? Obviously it was out on the 13th of March as a release but obviously you guys really hit the um, hit the ball with the pandemic having at the same time like um I guess it's a bit too far was how did you find having to go to like on demand kind of almost pretty immediately um and I guess the other half is like how do you find that kind of considering you had such positive festival reviews at um from across the board from critics did you find that's like helped the on demand release um I think yeah uh, the the timing with the pandemic was it was it was a shame um because yeah we had it we were releasing on 110 screens for six weeks and we lasted three days before they all shut so and nick, I guess you, the, and nick you were literally in sheffield or somewhere weren't you doing q and a's to promote the film you weren't it wasn't as if you hadn't quite started you were on tour yeah yeah you know it was kind of yeah the it was all you could the writing was on the wall and it was just kind of it was like it was like uh playing a violin on the titanic being like, oh, <laughs> should we stop doing this um it was so yeah it was pretty gutting but at the same time um i was i think i was just so for a long you know i had so much anxiety the whole time you know there's several points where i was sure the film was a failure and i was sure my film career was over and i was sure that this whole thing was a big mistake um so i was just i was just so happy that people liked it but to be honest you know it would be obviously i prefer more people to see it in the cinema and there's part of me that thinks well when when will i ever get to have another film in the cinema you know um especially with the way the direction of travel of the industry and stuff like that but um you know the important thing is just getting it out there and getting people to see it um that's really the focus and um you know we we were still able to enjoy the festival circuit and do the you know we we got our chance to celebrate the film i guess and now it's just we just want people to see it and i feel much worse 
for people you know i know i know uh, friends of mine that were just about to shoot their first film and they've you know they've been cancelled or or you know it's 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 posing so many challenges to people that i think actually we've we've been able to get the, the best of both worlds in the end you know we, we we got to promote the film very heavily and then we're now in a period where everyone is watching a lot of stuff and everyone's at home um, probably taking more risks on on or on the things that they're watching and, and being more experimental. So I think I think in the it, ultimately for the film, it's probably going to end up being a good thing. Hopefully, yeah. And, and as you say, Nick, you did. I mean, I remember talking to you early on. It was a big thing for you where it where it landed in its first playing, and it got into TIFF, didn't it? Which was a big big marker for that kind of what its journey might be after that. Yeah, I mean, we were all, you know, we we were desperate to get into TIFF. But I guess um, also, you know, it was, it was um, it's kind of scary once you get there, though, I guess. It's the first time, it's the first time um, that, you know, we've had our work uh, reviewed, in, you know, by all the critics and stuff, and that's pretty terrifying. And like, with when you're doing a student short, you, a lot of it's about learning, so you try and, you try and make a good film, but if it doesn't quite work out, you're not happy with it, you can move on to the next one. And you yeah. just don't have to show anyone. Or with an episode of TV, obviously, you know, the, you, the aim is to do a good job, but if, if you didn't for whatever reason, um, you may not get hired again, but also, you know, as a director, it, it, you could sort of hide your influence on it or whatever. Whereas no matter what happened with Come With Horses, we we're going to have to stand next to it and beat the drum um so that was i found tiff really really scary actually in fact i found most of it scary it's much easier doing it from the bedroom actually <laughs> well we're glad you've joined us from your your bedroom we're going to wrap it up there and while we have a little tradition which is i get the nfts students just to write in the chat thank you and then i'll send it to you afterwards and while they're doing that why don't you both just tell us something you wish you'd known earlier when you were at the nfts Think back to when you were at the NFTS and maybe what's your top tip for those students who are still in the middle of it? Oh, gosh. Joe, right. you can go first. Joe, you write seven shorts and get them made. Is that yours, Joe? I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to sound like I did everything right. <laughs> I, I think working as much as you can when you, when you first come out is, is a good idea. I suppose one thing I... I it's not exactly regret, but but I spent a lot of time early on a little bit too wide-eyed and naive, I think, in, in thinking that I could get a lot more original stuff off the ground, which now is more a reality. And it's only, you know, it's only four or five years later, so it's but it's but I spent a lot of time trying to make very big budget original concept ideas with people who in retrospect did absolutely did not have the capacity to, to do it. And of course, you know, those things didn't didn't pan out so it's hard to say because at the same time I, I've, I've learned a lot in the last few years from working on so many projects it's been a sort of a crash course but at the same time yeah if, if I could go back I, I maybe would have spent more time trying to get work on other people's tv shows you know in writers rooms I did a little bit of that but maybe more of that and maybe have kept some of those original ideas back for myself yeah. um most of which, you know, I, I, I still got the, the copyright to. So it's not, you know, I, I, I don't have any big regrets yet, I don't think. But I think that was the one thing. What, what about you? What do you wish you'd known earlier? I think, um, I think everything seems impossible until you do it. And then you go, oh, okay, I can do it. And I wish I spent less time thinking that I can't, I guess. And, I, and also um just like mental i think mental health that's probably something like i i found i find filmmaking really difficult and um not i think being uh, sometimes i was too obsessed and too single-minded and i think i could have achieved a similar result but been a bit happier during the process as well so um, that's for me what i'm trying to do now is like make sure i actually enjoy what i'm doing because that actually makes my work better anyway yeah. And do you have happy memories without putting words in your mouth? You miss miss being in Beaconsfield or happy to have left? Yeah, I love. I know they're, they're the best times. I miss. Uh, I miss um, uh, China Diner. I always try and slip into China, China Diner whenever. 
<laughs> I've never been. I've never been. Oh, you must oh, no, when you come back after the pandemic, we'll all go to China Diner. Please. And celebrating. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, guys, I think people really love the movie. There were lots of comments oh. about how great it is. And so wish you all the best with um with its release and what happens for the rest of the year. And Thanks very uh, much. just written China Diner is awful, by the oh, way. I just read that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what so, you're talking um, about. So it's obviously a split audience, but um, we wish you all the best because I hope uh, great things happen because you're good people. So you deserve it. Oh, thank you all very right. much. All the best. Cheers. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Guys, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for your time. Yeah.